Okay, go ahead and grab a seat, everybody. If you didn't get your coffee filled, you can get it filled up after church. When you can hang out and keep chilling. Okay, so, hey, if you're new to the bridge, I just want to say welcome. I'm so stoked that uh, you decided to spend your Sunday uh, worshiping the Lord uh, with a bunch of other people who also love God. And hopefully you feel welcome in this place. Um, our desire is that we would be just that, a bridge from uh, where anybody is at in their life to being able to know more about who God is, what he thinks about you and in this world, and that if there could be something where you could get to know God in a greater way, uh, that's a win for us. Um, and we come to church with that. I come to church with that heart posture as well. God, speak to me. And uh, man, that last song really ministered to me today. So I know uh, that's one of the reasons I'm here. So what we want to do as we move into our next part of, the, of our Sunday service is um, we study God's word. And uh, Dave is going to read our passage today. So if you have your Bibles, if you want to open them up to Genesis, that's where we, we've been studying, where we're going to be today. If you don't have a Bible, um, there's a bunch of different apps where you can get it if you want to use it on your phone. But um, we have some Bibles in the back, uh, on the back table. So if anyone would like a paper copy, if you raise your hand, we'll get one given to you. Awesome. One in the back corner right over here. Steve. Pickle, you want to grab a... Oh, no, Nate's got it. All right. I'll just call on your volunteer. Okay, so if you have your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 4, and Dave is going to read our passage today. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Dave Parker. For those that don't know you, don't know me, and I am reading the Bible this morning, and we are in Genesis chapter 4. So here we go. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, you will, not be, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out into the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied, am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Thank you. A great hush fell over the room. It's a heavy passage. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Um, before we go into chapter four of this first book, Lord, in our prayer, we want to be mindful of chapter one. 
that in the beginning, you have always existed. You are not bound by our limits of time and space and matter. You exist outside of these things that we can measure. You are unmeasurable. But the things that you reveal about yourself in chapter one, chapter two, is that in your greatness, in your power, you wanted us to know you. So you created a space, things we could measure. You created borders. You created this world. And then you created us that we may live in this world with you, experience you, rule with you. We believe that all things were good, like how you said it was very good. We see in this text that things are not good at this point. So, Lord, we come to you this morning, and this is what, what we're just saying with our hearts. You are good, Lord. In this broken world and things that are going on, we know without a doubt that you are good. So could you help us make sense and navigate through some of the bad? We love you. We ask that you would speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, <clears throat> And studying this this week and just kind of as we've been going through Genesis and our, our series is just called In the Beginning because we want to look at the beginning of all things. Now sin has entered the world. So we're even looking at how sin and brokenness entered the world. And if you're new here, um, so stoked you're here. We are moving through Genesis. If you want to pick up on anything that we've been over already, you can check out our YouTube channel or our podcast, and you can kind of get up to speed with, with where we're at and how we move into to, to where we are today. Um, but in the beginning, the whole idea is that, I mean, look at just this week in our world. There's, um, well, there's just war like, like there hasn't been before. There's, uh, there's just stuff happening at such a rate and it's just, it's easy to see. It's, it's hard to hide the evil. You can try to make, ex we can try to make excuses for it, but it's just like, dude, there is darkness. There is brokenness. There are things that are ha people are doing to each other. And we were like, where did this come from? What's the way forward? And when you do a, a humanistic view or just like, what can we do about this apart from God, your answers will end up being X, Y, and Z. But if you want to know what God wants to do and believe that he is good and has a way through, then we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and we read stuff like, in the beginning, God created what we see. God brought forth man. He gave man and woman their equal yet oppositeness. He's the one who talked about what it is to be one. He's the one who talks about what it is to rule. And so we go back and we look and, and then last week or the week before the tempter comes in and tempts Eve, Adam willfully so, and then sin comes in and then brokenness enters. Now we have the first family. Their kids that come in and this week, uh, very catchy title, the, the title of our message is Cain and Abel because I just wanted to be real clever there. So we have the first family. So what we're going to do, we're just going to step through these verses together. I'm going to make some points along the way, and then we're going to draw a conclusion at the end. We just want to point out some things on the way, because I don't know about you, but even now as I was reading it, I'm like, ooh, did I emphasize that enough? Oh, did you see that? There's so many things that we're being shown about the Lord in here. So we're going to zoom in on the brothers, Cain, and Abel. It's, uh, specifically, we're going to zoom in on what is kind of the focal point of this story. And it, did you catch it? It's an offering that they brought before the Lord. So in Genesis chapter 1, let's hit the first two verses. Adam made love to his wife. Or uh, some of your Bibles may say he knew his wife. And she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. 
Now, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. There's an uh, undisclosed amount of time that happens here. Uh, we're given, you'll see later in Genesis, you're kind of given some genealogies and you start getting some people's ages so you can start adding things up. Um, like you're given Adam's age when uh, one of his other kids is born. He's like 139 or something. But uh, here, we know how much time went past from when they were banished out of the garden from God and he made the skins for them and Eve got her first fur coat and they were... Um, on their own, um, in a new way, living in a new way with God's protection, but apart from the presence of God, to when they, she gave birth to a son, Cain. And then it says, and then later she gives birth to Abel. And then it says their professions. So apparently they're grown men. So an, a long time has come. They have raised these kids. There's, there's a lot that has happened. And then we are fast forwarded into when these men are at least old enough to have their own lives their own professions. Neither were married yet, um, but that's kind of, it's like now after a while, um, these kids came forth. In the course of time, so after, and when the time was right, or in the course of time, verse three, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So what is being said here? I want to point out a few things that are going on. When it comes to offerings, what we can see from this text. The first thing is this. If you're a note taker, I always encourage taking notes because this is one of the way God speaks to us. We write stuff down as we're, as we're listening and we're here with the open heart like we were singing earlier. And it's like, teach my song to rise to you, Lord. Speak to me from your word. And so as we're jotting stuff down and we go back and look later, even share it with your life group, intentional plug, you start to realize, whoa, this is what God is saying in my life. God is speaking to me here. That's pretty cool. It's not as, not as mystical as we might think hearing from the Lord. Uh, it's actually maybe a lot more practical than you might think. So here's some things to think about or jot down. The first thing about offering that we see from this text is this. Faith is the best gift to God. Faith is what is pleasing to him. The word offering is, is a gift um, anyone in here, your love language is you're a gift giver or you like to receive gifts? All of those kids, all of the, all of those love language people, they're in the, on the other side of that wall. All the kids who likes to receive gifts are like, mm, they're not shy about it. God's love language is gift giving. Um, I could just take a right-hand turn and talk about Jesus and the gift that he is to us, and we could end our morning there, but we'll, we'll end there in a minute. God loves gifts. The only thing that we're told about these offerings, these gifts that were brought before the Lord, is one of them God looked at with favor, and one of them he did not. Now, much has been made of this. Why, why was, I always mix them up, why was Abel's, looked at like, oh, it's almost like God was like, oh, man, you're awesome. And then he looks at Cain and he's all, you're an idiot. <laughs> but it says one was, one met, met a mark or a standard that God looked at with favor and one didn't. A lot has been said and some would say, well, because Abel brought um, stuff from the, the ground and by this point that should have been a blood sacrifice showing this, that, or the other. A lot of been, things have been, been said about it, but we're really, um, the only thing that we're told is one God looked at with favor and one he didn't. Why? 
It doesn't say here specifically, but this is why we take the Bible as the whole counsel of God, because if you keep going throughout Scripture, you get bits and pieces of different things, and you go all the way towards the end of the Bible, this book called Hebrews. And in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 11, verse 4, we read this, By faith, Abel offered a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commended him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. And if you skip down to verse 6 of Hebrews, chapter 11, it says this, And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. What was it that God accepted in Abel's offering that was not looked at with favor in Cain's? It was the way in which it was given. We'll talk about that in a minute. But faith is the best gift to God. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews it says, without faith it's impossible to please God. It doesn't matter how much you bring to him. It doesn't how much, matter how much money you give to charity. It doesn't matter how much you give to church. It doesn't matter how many good things um, that you do. The best offering to God is one given. It says, whoever comes to him must believe that he is and that he rewards those who seek him. It's the way in which God loves an offering given in faith. God, this is, maybe we say, it's not much like the woman with the two pennies. But Jesus said she put more than anybody because she put it in with faith. The second thing that we want to look at in this is God favors the faithful, not the firstborn. This is a deep point. I'm not going to unpack it all the way, but you look through Scripture the blessing, especially in the Old Testament, was always passed to the firstborn son. That's how it was supposed to be. They got the birthright, the inheritance, the property, all the stuff. God does something. Read the Bible. It'll trip you out over and over and over. He never, not never, but he's not bound by the law of the firstborn. God blesses, God favors the faithful, not the firstborn. Cain was the firstborn. How many firstborns are in here? Okay, now you firstborns, if you're really, how many of you firstborns taught your younger siblings what not to do? Yeah, just one. <laughs> I'll go with you, two. My sister never, she, she held her cards so close to her chest her whole life. She was like, JJ, I'm not telling anybody about that. Because us firstborns, we have a way of plowing the way, and our siblings can kind of look and be like, that, yep, that was good. Don't do that. <laughs> do this. Don't do that. Well, Cain was the firstborn. As a matter of fact, did you see that, that it's where it said um, Eve gave birth to uh, a son, and she says, with God's help, I have created a man. Well, she was an image bearer of God. So this was part of the curse of women as you took part in what God was doing. All life would come from women, but now due to the curse, it would, not, it would be a blessing and it would be the hardest thing you ever do. Through crazy amount of pain would come childbirth. So there would be a reminder of sin and the pain it caused, but also a reminder of the promise and the blessing of childbirth and future generations. She thought Cain was going to be the seed who crushed the serpent's head. You guys remember that from last week or whatever? The weeks, they just sort of blend together for me. But when we were talking about God's promises, when he speaks to the serpent, you will bruise, he says, I will put enmity between her seed and yours, is what uh, God spoke to the serpent in the garden. Meaning there's going to be war between the woman's seed and the serpent's seed. And there was going to be a simultaneous something that was going to happen. He told the serpent, her seed will crush your head and your seed will strike his heel. Like there was going to be this thing. 
she thought, she's like, with God's help, I have brought forth that man. So in her mind, this son, this firstborn son was the, the savior. This was the one who was going to make everything right that she and her husband and what they had been part of in the wrongs. She thought Cain who was going to be the one who crushed the serpent. She, he was Eve's hope of salvation. And this begins a theme, and hopefully you guys are seeing these themes that we're talking about in the first four chapters of the Bible. They repeat themselves and are packaged in different ways throughout Scripture over and over and over. This begins a theme of what we read in 1 Corinthians, which is a letter to the churches all the way in the New Testament after the time of Jesus that says this, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called or when you like gave your life to, to God. Or th He's like, think about your past. Paul is writing this to, or to uh, Christians. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. God chose the low, lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. It doesn't matter from what tribe you're from. It doesn't matter what family you're from. It doesn't matter if you're the firstborn, secondborn, or the eighthborn that isn't even invited into the dinner party because you're out taking care of the sheep. That's David wasn't even invited to the party because he wasn't the firstborn, but he was the one that God would choose to be his king. God favors the faithful, not the firstborn. That puts all of us in the same boat. The third thing is that motivation matters more than you think. The why behind the action. I've listened to, read a bunch of parenting books. I always, um, Steph passes stuff on to me. And, we, I, you know, lo I love to learn. And, um, you know, one of the things us as parents, when we say to our, especially when our kids are young, I don't know about you other dads in here, but I was guilty of this. When you look at your kid and you're like, why are you doing that? <laughs> it's not like a helpful thing. Actually, it kind of le uh, heaps shame on our kids, and we may not be wanting to do that, but when we're like, what is wrong with you? I, I don't know, I, do, I, never, I don't say that. I do now, they're, a bit, they're old enough. I just look at my kids and I'm like, what is wrong with you? That's actually what I say to myself. It still heaps um, shame, but just the why behind the action. Why do, you, why, do you, why do you do that? I wanna talk about the why behind these offerings. Because one was looked at with favor, one wasn't. We know that the better offering wasn't based on a status in life because it was the firstborn's offering that God said, that's not with favor. There's a difference in offering. And I think here it is. There's a difference between what you can get and what you can give. That's the difference between humility and pride. When there's an offering made to God, there's a couple of heart postures. There's the heart posture of who you're giving to, and so there's an offering made from that, or there's a heart posture as what am I gonna get out of this? Has anyone ever given to God with a heart posture of like, what am I gonna get out of this? No, none of us, never. Or most of us all the time. Just being like, God, here's this. You're a God who has, but so what, what's, what's that in it for me? We may not say it, um, but we wrestle with it. One says, look at me. 
in the fullness of time, Cain brought forth this uh, offering. Look at me. The other says, look at God. One is brought forth out of duty and the other out of worship. I'm getting a saying right now, and we should, it should say, offerings brought forth out of duty are duty. <laughs> that wasn't in my notes. <laughs> Write that down. That's the deal. Cain's um, offering and his anger was undoubtedly rooted in pride. He couldn't bear that his brother was accepted and he was not. When our approach to God is based on what we bring, we set ourselves up for disappointment. When we approach God based on what we bring, we set ourselves up for disappointment. Here's the disappointment that he experienced. Everything he did was in a spirit of comparison and competition. Even with offering to God. Let's look at what happens next. Pick it up in verse 5. So Cain We'll start in verse 4 again. And Abel also brought an offering. Fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Uh, some of your, your translations might say, his countenance fell. Um, there was this sense of a bomb went off on the inside. It will go off on the outside later, but something happened in here. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. That song we were singing, teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you, Jesus, you're my hope and stay. I was thinking about that song when we were singing it. I actually got to meet the guy who wrote that song. He spoke at the bridge years ago. I heard that song, and no, what, no offense, but I thought you like some old person wrote it. He was like this super hip guy, lived in Nashville. He's like writes hits. It's like what he does. It's a gift of songwriting. He was wearing cowboy boots and tight jeans, and I was like, man, this guy, this dude's cool. But then he told me the, the, the conditions in which he wrote that song. He was in such a dark place in his life. It was a, literally a cry out to God. This is what God is saying to Cain here, like, hey, why are you so mad? If, you, if your heart was in the right place, wouldn't everything be good? And then he's like, but here's what's the deal. Sin is crouching at your door, and it is contrary to you. The serpent is not for you, it's against you, and you must rule over it. And we're singing that song, I'm like, Teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way. Like, wouldn't it be sweet if it was just like programmed into you when we're thinking about when something kind of hits? Temptation. What was Eve tempted with? Oh, it's good. Looks good. It's going to feel good. I was gonna, I'm going to be better. And then you do it, and you're like, oh, dang it. it didn't, still, again, it didn't work. It's like if we could just be like, hey, I'm good. Temptation. My song's going to rise to Jesus, and I'll be fine. Everything's going to be great, but that's not how it is. You're being lured. You're being enticed. And when I cannot stand, he says, I'll fall. That's true. Where you fall is important. I fall on Jesus. There's a lot being said on there, for he is our hope and stay. 
because he knows who he's falling on. This is what God is saying to Cain. Like, don't, what's, uh, what's the deal? Why are you so angry? Don't focus on him. He was comparing himself to his brother, comparing their offerings. And in comparing, he started competing. Verse 8, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. This is how we know it was a faith thing that was the issue. Cain's disposition was immediately displayed. Kind of like when something happens in life and the way we respond, Jesus says, out of the, heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. People say like, you know, what's, you know what's inside the sponge when it gets squeezed. It can sit there and look good, then you squeeze it, and what comes out, you're like, oh, that was in there. <laughs> so we know what's inside by some of the stuff that comes out. Now, that doesn't have to define us, and there's a way forward through those things, but when something gets squeezed, what comes out kind of shows. So this happens. Cain gets super TO'd, and God's like, what is happening? And his countenance fell. His disposition was immediately on display. His natural response was anger. His natural response was accusation. Why is his good and mine's not? Am I not enough for you, God? It's always been like this since I was a kid. I've always been the black sheep. And it just starts coming up. It's been good for those people, but not for me. It's always been like this. He's the baby of the fam. Like, what comes out shows what's going on on the inside. And here's what's crazy, and this is why we'll get to it in the conclusion. It wasn't just for them. This is for us. Because spiritual pride around things like offerings to God started this day. They've been going on ever since. Our church is better. We do it better. It, it can come from this heart thing that, like, we're comparing, and with comparing comes competitions. One of the reasons myself and, like, seven other pastors in our city, me, we meet together every week. Because we noticed during COVID, especially, you guys know that nobody got, like, an instruction manual before that happened <laughs> on, like, here's how you do the, all everything. It sort of happened, and then you saw everyone's response, and you kind of saw like a lot of what was already going on by the way people responded. You're like, oh, snap, that was in there already, I think, because of look at everyone's like huge reactions to all of this stuff. But something that we noticed, I, I noticed, I started comparing myself like never before to other pastors. I always kind of liked me. <laughs> I got plenty wrong with me. There was a time in my life where I would have given anything to trade my life for someone else's. I remember sitting in jail when I was like 16 years old, and the world was passing by. I, we sat where I could watch this highway, and people just whoom, 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 back and forth all day long. And I just remember being like, man, the world is just going on without me. No one even knows I'm in here, and they're just fine. Look at them. That person's going to lunch. They're doing this. And I just remember just sitting there being like, dude, I would trade. I would, I would, here's, you know, confession. I would trade my life with someone based on what I thought about their car. Something I could see. I'm like, oh, that's a cool car. I'd totally trade with that person. Then I get older and you realize people have all sorts of cars and all sorts of issues. What's going on the outside doesn't show us what's going on in the inside, but outside things influence <laughs> our inside motivations. So when COVID happened and we're trying to figure stuff out, we didn't have a building. We had to go online. For all of you new people, this building, just know you're stepping into a gift. Amen. You're stepping into something that God gave us when we couldn't afford it. We couldn't fill it. We had curtains up right here in this thing. In this aisle here, we had this many chairs because when we finally got this place, there was like 30 of us that showed up. And we're like, sweet. 
but we always knew what God, we believed what God wanted to do. So we're standing in a product of, of answered prayer, and, and it's going to continue because that's the God we serve. But we, all of a sudden you're told, you're not doing it right. This, this church is doing it. This is, I'm talking about spiritual pride. I know I'm taking a rabbit trail, but this is what we're talking about. It's like this sense of, are we doing it good enough for people? And you almost forget, like, are we doing this good enough for, for God? And we noticed that there was a spirit of comparison that was rising up in me. Because if someone left here and went to another church, they're, what they're saying is they're doing it better in some way. And so you're like, oh, we're not as good. But here's where the endorphin drug works. People show up here, and they tell us why we're doing it better, and then all of a sudden I feel good again, because now I'm better than where they just left. And so I'm up, I'm down. I'm good because we're doing it good. I'm bad because we're doing it bad. But what it is is I was like, dude, I am, as God was speaking to me, he's like, how's this comparison thing going? I was like, it's exhausting. It's exhausting. Because when comparison starts, competition comes because you need to be better. So then the comparison breeds this unhealthy competition. That's what Cain was going through. God made it clear it did not need to be this way. If you do well, will you not be accepted? So we know that the antidote to jealousy is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. It's a pure heart. The antidote to jealousy is honesty. It's clarity of self. There was an opportunity for Cain to have repentance and experience newness. If you do, and if you do not do well, he says, like here's an opportunity. Sin is crouching at your door, and here's its desire for you. It's not to make you better by beating your brother or having a better offering, or being the better church, or being the better person, or being the better family, or being the better nation, or being the better whatever. The sin and the temptation is contrary to you. It will tear you down, and you will not be what it is that you're looking for by comparing yourself to your brother. So how did he respond? Not well. He was unable to do well. And this is a note to... I'm thinking about what Eve must have felt, what Adam must have felt, to see this response in their child. How many of us are products of what we would call good families, but we sort of went off the rails? And God can bring us back. I love this church because when that happens, hands actually go up. It's, there's a spirit of honesty and like, yeah, that's part of my story. Um, and when we come, when we get older and we say stuff like, gosh, I wonder what that was like for my mom. We start to see things through other people's eyes, not just ours. Like, what would that have been like for our, my parents? And then maybe that's our experience as parents. And a child has gone off and done something. And you just was like, man, that, that was crouching at their door forever. And the, the desire. And you just see them in this broken state. And you just desire them to not be in that place. I think about that because... Eve, she knows this feeling of, of failure. She knows this feeling of being tempted. She had to be, here's the difference, and here's how generational sin happens. She was tempted into sinning. The devil saw her, enticed her, drew her away. She had to be drawn away from trusting in God to, to, to believe the lie that she could trust yourself. But one generation later, so she had to be talked into sinning, and Cain couldn't be talked out of it. That was it. That's where he was going. That's what was in him. That's what he was seeking. And God himself, it took the devil to talk Eve into sinning, and God himself couldn't talk Cain out of it. Cain's action was the natural outcome of his attitude. So Cain spoke to his brother took him in the field, and killed him. One generation in, we have premeditated murder. We have the action that says on the, in heart, uh, on the inward parts, my life matters, your life doesn't. Ending your life will make me 
feel the way I'm supposed to feel. I will feel better about myself if you aren't around. Brothers, we do the most hurtful things to the people we love the most. We say the most hurtful things to the people we love the most. The parent who says to the child, you're dead to me. The child that says to the parent, you're dead to me. The siblings that say to each other, the things that tear our families apart, when you trace them all the way back to the root, often it's pride. It's comparison. So-and-so got this much in the will, and I didn't get anything. So this happened here. This happened. You trace it all the way back. This is the root of so much brokenness in our families. One person sought themselves over all others. And the hard part is, well, the hard part for me is when I trace it all the way back, that was me. I was the one that told all my family that they were dead to me and went off and did my own thing. And I, was the bro I got the most broken but I wouldn't change it for anything because it was God who was able to show me the most important things, what he thinks about me, and then redeem the rest of it. Amen. So here's what I want to say about this before we move on to the last bit. <coughs> Jealousy, when it runs its course, it turns into <coughs> resentment. And resentment, when it runs its course, will turn into rage. So what happens next? This next exchange we're going to talk about is where we're going to conclude for the day. I'm going to point out three things, and um, this is where we'll stop for the day, but pick it up in verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, these are good questions to underline if you want. The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Like there's a sense of um, arrogance in that statement. And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground, verse 11, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened up its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me, you have driven me today away from the ground and away from your face. I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be, shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Edom. East is always in the Old Testament a sign of like away from God. Um, st uh, hardship, Babylon, Syria, they all came from the east. The garden represents God's presence with mankind being cast out to the east, was away from God's presence. That's where Cain went. He built a city, which if you keep reading, um, and, you, and it, you, it traces his lineage for a minute. But this part, apart from knowing all that we've talked about, can be confusing. So I just want to close with this. This Cain and Abel is two things. It's a story to tell. We're telling it. But it's actually a story to teach. It's a story to teach us something. So I want to look at three things as we close. The way of Abel, the way of Cain, and the way of God. The way of Abel was one of genuineness, contentment, and simplicity. When you get to the New Testament, what does it say things about having a content life? Quietness. Uh, one hand with contentment, Proverbs tells us, is better than storehouses full of contention. Just one, ha one handful with contentment is so much better in this life than, than tons and tons with all the issues that come with it. He wasn't in competition with his brother. 
It says Cain brought forth this offering, and then Abel brought, it wasn't like Abel's like, oh, animals or fruit from the land? <laughs> Sweet. Watch this. And he's like slaughters a sheep and then it's fat portions, and it's like, boom. You, were, you were, had your eyes closed when you were worshiping? I had both hands in the air, and I was standing on one foot. <laughs> it was just what he had. It's just what he wanted to bring to the Lord. It says, and then when it was Abel's time, he brought this. It had nothing to do with his brother. It had everything to do with God. He brought what he had when he could. How do you give to God? Do you compare what you bring with so-and-so with this and that? Oh, it's not as much as this or stop. Stop. You bring what you have when you can. And remember, that's about who you're offering your life to, not who did more or less. That pleases God. So whether it's financial or your time at work or your best with your family or the, your best with yourself, whatever it is, just bring who you are with what you have unto God as an offering. And he will look on it with favor. It's blessable. Amen. It says that his example still speaks to us today. What's the way of Cain? Cain's example still speaks too. Jude, verse 11 says, Woe to them, speaking about, you can read the book of Jude, it's talking about contending for the faith and stuff like that. But it says, Woe to them, this group of people, they have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed into profit, they have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. rebellion. It's talking about there's a spiritual pride that people put others on blast to benefit themselves. It's been happening since Cain. It still happens. Watch out for that. Cain's offering looked better than his brother's, he thought, because it was rooted in pride and jealousy. He brought first. That's why it says Cain brought an offering. There was something about he needed to be first. He needed to win. Brothers are hilarious. There's a healthy competition that brings out the best of us. Unhealthy competition brings out the worst of us, worse than us. The way of Cain was the way of the serpent. Sin is, and this is what you need to take home today. Sin is crouching at the door for all of us. And its desire is not to make you better. Its desire is to master you. Jesus says the enemy's plan is to steal, kill, and destroy. But he wants you to experience abundance. Things that will steal your joy, kill your joy, steal, kill, and destroy, and destroy your joy, your life, live in constant comparison with people. Keep your way above everybody else's way. Never succeed um, in in. Succeed, is that the word I'm looking for? Where you like let someone else win? Let someone else's, whatever. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> no matter what Cain did from this day on, there was something that was missing. He never found peace. He never found contentment. And his first thing was to, was to blame his punishment on God. That's not fair. It was with them forever. There's so many people that live in our world that was stuff that has happened to them. And instead of coming to God and being like, God, this is who I am. This is where I'm at. We just go like this. It was their fault. It was their fault. This happened. And we just live this whole life where we can never be comfortable in our own skin. And that's what God wants to bring. He's like, you just come to me. But we keep pushing people away. We keep pushing God away. And eventually... We push ourselves even outside of God's presence. People just go off and do their own thing. We all have the opportunity and the power to rule over temptation, not by our sacrifices, what we bring to God, um, or like what we cut away, but by our worship, what we, what we sing to him, what we say to him.
Let's look at the way of God. Let me make this last statement before we do. The way we, we prevent sin from ruling over us by allowing God, we prevent sin from mastering us by allowing God to master us first. Let's look at the last thing, the way of God. God knows everything, correct? Yeah. He knew what he was going to build before he built it. He knew how to build. So he knows everything. So when he says, where is your brother? What have you done? He already knew the answer, right? So his questions are intended to instruct us. And the way we respond to him shows us what's in our heart. So Yahweh, the creator God, the holy and just God, you might have heard those terms before. A lot of times we don't know exactly what they mean. We just know they're important. God, you're holy and you're just. You're like, yeah, ooh. It's like Mufasa. <laughs> Say it again. Ooh. Holy and just. Holy, the absence of sin. Uh, there is no sin in God. There is, he's holy, he's apart, set apart. Just, uh, perfect. There's nothing. There's nothing wrong. There's. There's. Um, he's perfect. God is light in Him. There is no darkness at all. So this is something that we are all to know, that God is holy and God is just. Sin must be dealt with. There was something that happened that God dealt with. There was a way in which He dealt with it. So sin, because God is holy and God is just. He will deal with things like murder, things like hate, things like uh, injustice. But here's, and God, let me just read what I wrote. God is a God of justice and holiness. Sin must be dealt with justly. Cain's sin of murdering his brother, Abel, required the justice of God himself. Murder is an attack on the creator who made humanity in his own image and after his own likeness. But here's the thing. Ready? Last point. God executes justice, never revenge. I want you to think about that throughout the week. God executes justice. He never executes revenge. The mark of Cain, and he put a mark on him. Anyone ever heard of the mark of Cain before? Everyone's like, what is it? Like maybe he sliced him across the face so everyone was like, Ugh, when they saw him. We don't know what it was, but it was something that set him apart. Here's what it was. It was so no one could eg execute, execute. No one could ha take revenge on him. He wasn't overlooking what he did. It was like, I, he is mine. I will execute justly. If anyone else comes in, they'll execute revenge. Exercise. Revenge on him. God never does revenge. God never goes, oh, you did that? <laughs> you know the law of revenge is a, is a times five multiplication. There's math behind this. That's how you know it's real. When someone does something to you that hurts, your retaliation will be a multiplication of five. That's why when someone's like, he said something mean to me, so I kicked his dog. <laughs> that guy's like, you kicked my dog. I, you know, did, I smashed in your car window. Next thing you know, there's like trade and blows in the parking lot, and someone stands on the side, and they're like, well, that escalated quickly. <laughs> that's the law of retaliation, God, but, and we, that's what we want. God's like, no one, no one can do that. He knows all things, and God will handle each individual. But here's what we need to know about God. God extends grace and forgiveness to sinners. Amen. That's what he sees. He wants to talk to that person. Where are you? Where are we at? What's going on in your life? What did you do? You... Don't have to be led away by that thing. It can be different for you. And, this, and people make their choices. But God is not a revenging um, God. He's just. He is holy. But he's, he's love. 
And so there's always an invitation to just come as you are. That's why you can say, you can just be you. You don't have to be like that person. You don't have to be like that person. You don't have to clean up your life before you come to God. He's like, man, you ain't ever going to clean up your life. Just come to me. And let me just do what I'm going to do because he brings out holiness. He doesn't just change our behaviors. He does the inside thing and it starts working out. That's how you can be, just look like how you look and be the light of the world. That's what it is to know Jesus and walk with him and let him work in your life. It's revolutionary and it's getting lost in culture. But it can come back. And God wants it to come back. That's what we're going to end today. Let me pray. And uh, let's sing this last song and then let's enjoy the rest of our Sunday. Father, as we, uh, as we close this, I think the, the closing prayer and the... Um, the response of our hearts to you is um, well it makes me think of King David where he would talk about all the stuff that was going on in his life really unfiltered before you he would share it all and then he would typically say something like but Lord search me and know me you tell me what's going on inside of me and help me to trust you for the way forward. So I just want to speak that for us. I believe that is a word that you would have for us is that we could say, Lord, search me. And the reason we can say that is because we know that you're good and we know that you care. And we know that by asking you to do that, we don't have to be afraid that you're gonna come in and just stomp all over our lives, but that you're gonna repair. You're gonna bring new. You're even gonna exchange the broken for the whole, the dark for the light. So Lord, would you just kind of look inside, just take a moment of, of just like between you and the Lord and if you want to, you can be like, Lord, would you just come in? I invite you in. If you would have me, I would be yours. And he would never turn you away. And so, Lord, as we go about the rest of our day, we know that so often in life, things don't just aren't fixed but a, the needle is turned just a little bit to give us a new bearing, a new heading. And we want that to be headed towards you, Lord. So we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the time of worship. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this example, even though if it's part of it is learning what not to do, by learning what not to do, we are learning what to do. And we know that you are the one in which we bring our lives to. You will never turn us away, and we can just bring what we have when we have it. So, Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.